I want to thank you, Paul, for joining us. And I also, um, I also want to thank the Bainbridge Community Foundation for supporting this series. They've been just great. And I know this is one of a series of talks that you've been giving. Um, and we appreciate you coming to the Senior Center as part of that, uh, that enterprise. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I love the opportunity to share. Uh, I retired in 2012, and I have spent most of the time since uh, building my foundation and uh, finding different ways to educate people, articles on a regular basis at marketwatch.com, podcast every week, uh, books. I've got a new book coming out in a couple of weeks I'll talk about uh, that everyone can afford. Uh, and uh, uh, glad to help in any way that I can. I am no longer an investment advisor. I am not licensed to do anything but teach. And you don't have to have a license, it turns out. But I wanted to focus today uh, on the Vanguard funds for part of the presentation. A lot of people uh, use Vanguard funds. They are the biggest retail fund family with over $6 trillion under management. They offer some of the finest mutual funds in the industry. The only mutual fund family built truly for the, for the investors in the funds, uh, in that as the fund family has grown and more money has come in, the expenses have gone down. Uh, and it was started by a fellow named John Bogle back in 1976. And he has changed the industry. Even if you never owned a Vanguard fund, his work in forcing down the expenses inside of mutual funds have in fact had an impact on your investments. So why Vanguard funds? Lower expenses, low turnover, low taxes, more diversification, some people would say that you, if you diversify more, you make less, but it turns out studies show that if you diversify more, you tend to make more. And Vanguard has produced not always, uh, number, not always the first one to, to do something, but by golly, when they do it, uh, they produce strategies and portfolios that are truly built for the investor which includes all of these things like lower expenses and lower taxes and lower turnover, all in your best interest. I've got about, I've got 12 funds I want to talk about briefly, then I'm going to talk about uh, for a few minutes at the end, uh, a, how, how to buy a pension uh, for people who would like to have a pension. Uh, but one of the 12 funds I'll talk about is the one that my wife and I use. And it is the fund that we use for things like uh, emergencies. Uh, the first week of each year, we dip into our investment pool uh, portfolios. We take out the whole year's income right there one time. We don't have to worry about month to month. Is this a good time to go back in and take more money? So it's emotion free. And we put that money in a short term investment grade bond fund. Um, let me get my pointer here just to, uh, they have many short-term bond funds, you tax-free, federal, uh, and whatnot. I use the short-term uh, because it gives a better rate of return, uh, and, um, and it gets a much higher return than you would expect to get in a money market fund. Uh, here are the, the particulars. These are all out of Morningstar. If you're not a user of Morningstar and you really want to understand how mutual funds work, uh, I encourage you to take the time. Don't have to subscribe, pay any money. I've, I never use anything more than their free service. And uh, you can really learn a lot about mutual funds and compare them to others uh, using Morningstar. So I'm going to focus on some things that I think are important about this particular fund. Uh, one is that its SEC 30-day yield is 0.95. Now, when you look at the yield of these investments, sometimes you'll see them, uh, they'll be higher. But what they are reflecting uh, typically 
are the returns over the last year. So if you're in a period of time that interest rates are dropping, really the 30-day yield is a lot more meaningful than the last year. So I use the last 30 days as uh, how they're doing right now. The expense ratio, uh, 0 0.10. Uh, I'm going to go over here for a second and close you all down so I can see more of my screen. Maybe I'm not. Okay. Um, the 10-year uh, return on the short-term investment grade bond fund has been 2.63%, the 15-year return 35 At Morningstar, they give you 10 and 15-year returns. They also give, give you one, three, and five, but 15 is the longest that you can look at easily, but it does allow us to compare to other funds in the same category. And so what I've done here is show you not only how they have done, but here's the average in that category. So that's a lot of difference in return. When I'm talking to young people, and I, I would say this to somebody who's coming into retirement, if you can show, find a way to add another half a percent to your return, certainly as a first time investor, but even as a 65 year old, for example, and living a, a, a 30 year life or 30 or whatever, you have a chance to potentially double your return if you can find ways to, to add an extra half of 1%. So I think that being able to be better than average sounds to me like there's a chance maybe to do better than some people are doing, not using this particular fund, but using a fund from a different family. Uh, typically, that's because they have higher expenses, by the way. Uh, that's the one variable that means the most in any particular asset class. And we always have to remember that that 197 is the average, which means a lot of people made less than 197. So uh, I, I really, the fact that they have these very low expenses, uh, give them, that's an extra boost that you got to make sure you can take care, take advantage of. I also thought it would be important in all of the funds that I show you over the last 15, what was the worst year? Well, it turns out in every case, it was 2008. And this fund was down 4.65%. Now that's a big loss for something that is short term as a bond. But as you may recall, corporate bonds got hit hard, very hard in the collapse of, 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 of 2000, 2008. The high yield bond funds, there were high yield bond funds down 20 to 40%. High grade bond funds were down over 10 uh, that are intermediate to long term. So this is what happened in that worst year. And it was one of the worst years that this fund has ever had. Uh, so I don't expect that to happen often, but that is the risk that's built in that, uh, that we, people might not know if somebody doesn't tell them. The funds that turn out to be the most successful for the long term, and this is true, by the way, for young investors as well as older investors. And, and those are funds that are balanced, some combination of stocks and bonds. Uh, particularly when we get into retirement, we probably, most of us don't want to take the, the risk of the loss of half of our money, which is what you're expected to lose from time to time in an equity, all equity portfolio. Doesn't mean that anybody who's ever picked their own stocks believes they're about to lose 50%, but the history is like from 2000 through 2009, twice investors uh, lost over 50% of their money in, um, uh, in their equity holdings. So. What you do typically to, to offset all that volatility of stocks is you add some bonds. The thing about the balanced fund that makes them special is not necessarily the return they actually make, but the return their investors get. There's a huge difference in the mutual fund industry between what the funds make and what the investors who invested in those funds make. A radical example that Morningstar reported on years ago 
was a, a fund called CGM Focus. CGM Focus was, if not number one, one of the top ranked funds for a 10 year period ending in 1998. They compounded, I believe at about 18%. Then they tracked the money flow in and the money flow out. They couldn't track each individual investor, but they could track the fund itself and determine what kind of a return did people who invested in that fund actually make. It turned out to be a negative 16% a year. And the reason that happened was because people, when it was up and doing great, just piled in and, and, and invested millions and millions of dollars. And then when everybody thought it was so great, it collapsed. And where do they sell? Well, they tend to sell when they find out that they've got way more risk than they bargained for and they sold at a loss. But the overall actual return of shareholders was a loss while the fund itself could legally report a gain. The balanced funds tend to keep people in there, staying the course. And for that reason, balanced funds have better performance. Their returns are very close to the returns of the funds themselves. The very best balanced fund I know and probably the best retirement investment uh, that in, particularly young investors have access to uh, is a target date fund. We didn't have that when we were young. Well, we didn't have index funds, many of us, when we were young. I started in the business in 66, and uh, it wasn't until 76 that we had such a thing as an index fund. And it wasn't until 2003 that we had, um, excuse me, that was, I, I think it was 94. 1994 was the first target date fund. And what was unique about this is that the manager didn't just take the responsibility of I'll manage your money, 60% equity, 40% fixed income, or 100% uh, aggressive growth, because that's the way that funds were built. They were built to do one thing and you had to be smart enough to know when's a good time to get out of that maybe add some bonds and this is what the target date fund does for the first time you as an investor and particularly young investors who who may not have any experience and not know what to do with the money that they're going to put in their 401k the target date fund is the equivalent of a pension fund in terms of what it does it puts you in the position that you should be at at your age so that when you are just starting in your 20s at Vanguard in, the, in their target date fund uh, for people retiring in the year 2060, they're putting away 10% into bonds. I don't like that. I don't want any bonds in a 21-year-old's account because bonds keep you from making money. But Vanguard has their reasons for doing that, and it does not have to do with performance. But over the years, you can see all that blue is equity. The red or orange, whatever color you see it as, that's the bond portion. So over your life, it is automatically inside of the fund doing that. So by the time, and I'm 77, by the time you're 77, Vanguard in the target date fund that people might have invested in many, many years ago are now investing your money with 70% in fixed income and 30% in equity. But they're not all alike. Here's the BlackRock target date fund for 2060. And it doesn't have any fixed income in the early years. And when you get to be 75, it turns out that they recommend or they manage it with 40% equity. So each target date fund has the unique uh, uh, outlook of the people who manage it. Not as market timers, but it's more about what is appropriate for people at a certain age. And they're not trying to look at me as an individual investor, they can't. They have to look at all of us who are that age have some sort of what we would call, I guess, an average risk tolerance, an average need for return. It isn't perfect, but what is makes it the best is that 
it gives a young person who may not ever know, a lot of people don't know anything about investing through their whole life. People who have pensions and live off those pensions, they never had to learn about investing if they thought they could live off social security and a pension. Well, that's not the world today. These young people are gonna have to live off of these 401ks and 403bs, et cetera. And so this will take care of their money for them. And here is what I think is some of the best evidence in terms of it's the right thing to do. Uh, a study was done by uh, Wharton and they looked at 12 million accounts at Vanguard, 12 million accounts. And some of them, pardon me, I think it was 1.2 million accounts, not 12 million. Some of those people did not have any target date funds. Some had some target date funds and some had all target date funds. The people that had the target date funds only made from 2003 through 2015, one, on average, 2.3% 1. Uh, more money. And so if a half a percent is a big deal, and it is, then um, if you could pick up an extra 1% by simply using a target date fund over what other people are likely to do, you're probably on the right track. So target date funds are great for 21-year-olds. What about a 61-year-old? Well, basically at Vanguard, at, at 65, they're going to have you 35 uh uh, I'm sorry, 50% in equity and 50% in, in fixed income. By the time you are 70, they're going to have you 30% in almost in equity and, uh, uh, and 70% in fixed income. Anyway, that's, that is the way a target date fund works for a, uh, a person, whether you're at 21, because you, for example, you might be retiring in 2025. So you would be about five years away probably. Uh, you would be probably 60% equity and 40% fixed income uh, at Vanguard. So they can be used and they're legitimate. And their expenses are low. This is the 2015 target date fund for people who already retired. But you can see right now they are 35% equity, 70%, 65% uh, bonds, 70% of the equities are US, 30% are international, 75% of the bonds are US, 25% is international. They have over 10,000 stocks and over 24,000 bonds in the portfolio. So you get a ton of diversification, you get very low expenses, and you get somebody taking care of your money that is likely just as smart as somebody you and I might hire. The difference is that if you and I hired somebody, they may take a look at our situation and say, you know, you got all this real estate over here, you're collecting money there, you got rental, yeah, you're going to inherit a bunch of money. You can afford to take more risk than what the target date fund would would expose you to so that individual investor can help those people get headed in the right direction now whether they have to manage your money or you go do it at vanguard on your own that's a big decision that was the business i used to be in then vanguard has what they call life strategy funds they have life four of them one is 20 percent in equities one is 40% in equities, one is 60, and one is 80. Each one of those are built to be that way forever. There's no change coming. It is, if you wanted to, for example, do something like this. If you wanted to start as a person in their 20s and 30s, you might go into the growth strategy. You uh, might then trade go from 80 down to 60% equity, and then from 60 down to 40. And then maybe by the time you're 80 or 90 years old, you might go down to the 20% uh, equity strategy. But they are balanced portfolios for people 
who want to select where they are. They're not telling you what to do. You have to identify who you are. It is a fund of funds, as many of the funds are at Vanguard. The expenses of point 11 are the expenses of this fund and the underlying fund. So you don't pay anything extra uh, to do this. They take care of it for you uh, for a fee of 11 one hundredths of 1%. Again, you're going to have, this is going to look fairly normal here, 10,000 stocks and 24,000 bond, different bonds, but that is being done with, in this case, 20% equity. But if you moved up to the 40% equity, the conservative growth, there again, they have 10,000 stocks and 24,000 bonds, but instead of 20% in equities, they have 40% in equities. And the worst year, by the way, was a loss of almost 20%. And the compound rate of return for 10 years was 6.32, the average in the industry 5.74, and 5.73 for 15 years versus the average in the industry of 5.25. And it has a yield because they do pay, there are some bonds in the portfolio and some of the stocks pay dividends. When you have 10,000 different stock companies in the in the in, in the portfolio, you are going to get some dividends. The bonds, of course, are all dedicated to creating uh, interest income. And this is also important. The bonds are all investment grade, no junk. And the reason I say that's important is simply because um, junk bonds, as I mentioned earlier, can have some very severe losses uh, and um, so this is another one of these bonds. In fact, I think all of the portfolios I'll show you today, the funds uh, use investment grade bonds. Here's one of, here's an old timer, Wellesley, started in 1970. Again, another Vanguard fund. Uh, its expense ratio is 0 0.16, 16100 so Again, very cheap. It is a portfolio of stocks and bonds, some 68 large cap value stocks. And that's important because value stocks are companies that typically uh, pay dividends and uh, typically are not the hottest growth stocks on the market. You, you, you would find more conservative kinds of companies there. They have some 1,281 bonds. They have a a little, a little bit of equities that are international. So it's basically a US portfolio, but it's 40% equities. So this is another way to get 40% equities, but instead of having 10,000 companies and 24,000 bonds, you've got a handful of companies, but all very high, high quality, well-established companies, uh, they're huge. They're some of the largest companies in the country. They just aren't the most risky. This fund uh, is one of two funds that I've used for 20 years with people that I've met for a few minutes who are older, who uh, don't know much about the, 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 the portfolios or the mutual funds. Uh, or investing period. And the reason I like Wellesley is number one, it's conservative. And uh, number two, it's been around for a long time. And number three, it's part of the Vanguard family. All things that may give them a sense of security. Uh, and why somebody should take advice from somebody they just met on the street, I don't know. But I've given them this, this is my best piece of advice for these conservative people. Now, that's pretty conservative only 40% in equities. So I also give them another fund. I give them the Wellington Fund. It's even older. It started in 1929. It was the first balanced fund. So it has, it has it emotionally, there's something about 
a fund that's been around for a long time and is still doing well. As a matter of fact, you'll notice the last 15 years, it made 8.42 and the last 10 years, 10.76, and it's 40% in bonds. Now, it is not as value-oriented as uh, Wellesley. So, and it has a little more in international. So there's some diversification going on here. And so what I've done for a lot of people, and I don't do this myself because I've got a full-blown portfolio of big, small value growth, U.S. international, val uh, small cap value, emerging markets. Uh, that's what you can do if you want to be fancy, but you can also do a lot of that if you just had half of your portfolio in Wellington and the other half in Wellesley, that means you'd be 50-50 stocks and bonds. And that's what my wife and I are. We are 50-50 stocks and bonds. It represents the amount of risk that we as 70-year-olds are willing to take. But those two funds give them diversification in different kinds of companies all conservative, all large. It gives them lots of bonds, a little bit of international, and a very fine return. And by the way, speaking of a half a percent being a big deal, if you look at Wellington compared to its competition, the average at uh, Morningstar is 7.53 versus 9.76. That, that's more than 2% more return. That's a life changer. If you could pick up an extra 2%, you'd have extra money in your pocket to either give, Bainbridge Community Foundation would like to hear about, so would the Senior Center like to hear about that. You can give it or you can, or you can live on it. But the fact is, why not have that? If one of the main reasons that you get that it's because of the lower expenses. And again, it's been around since 1929. No load to get in, no load to get out. Now here's another 60% equity portfolio. And another very fine balanced fund. And you'll notice its yield is about two, expense ratio is, 0.13, it is one of these life strategies, one of these things you can just set it and forget it at 60% equities, 40% bonds for your whole life if you wanted to. I once wrote an article about one portfolio for life and it was basically 60% in equities, 40% in bonds, and that's all you ever held your whole life. And historically, that has given a very fine return. That's particularly, by the way, would be for young people who don't have much risk tolerance. So here again, the life strategy fund did better than the average in that category. And it had a worse one year of 26.5%, uh, which by the way, was uh, more than the worst year for the Wellington fund, which is also 60%. And are we surprised to find out we have those same 10,000 stocks and 24,000 bonds? This fund is different. It's another balanced fund. I think it's a super fund, but it's all US, no international. And I would expect an all US portfolio probably did better than something that had internationals in it because internationals over the last 10, 15 years have not been as good as US. Doesn't mean that will continue to be that way because there were long periods of time in the past where the internationals did better than the US. And that's just like large and small and just like value and growth, these things, they, they do go oftentimes in trends that last for a very long period of time, and then it changes. And the idea of building a portfolio is to try to set it up so that you have some value, you have some growth. In this particular case, this is one that is more growth-oriented. 
its uh, expense ratio is only seven one hundredths of one percent. Over the last 10 years, 9.63. Over the last 15, 7.91. Uh, a very fine fund. Individual stocks, not which, which means you're, you didn't pick up the internationals. Before, when you had those uh, 10,000 stocks, you had some U.S. and you had some international. But a very fine fund. And you'll see in a few minutes when I show you what I did for uh, a, a lady recently, or at least what I recommended. I don't know what she did. I'm not her advisor, but, but I at least gave her, told her what I would do if I were in her position. Uh, I use several of these balanced fund, uh, and put them together to try to accomplish her goal with more, with less risk, basically, and more diversification. Now, some of you may have plenty of bonds or CDs. You don't care about uh, the fixed income part as far as using Vanguard. Or you may be trying to help one of the young people in your family, and you don't think that the target date fund is the best uh, investment uh, instrument to, to use. Let me just show you some all equity funds. They're all very similar but they all have something in common. They're basically focused on the very largest companies in our country. The first one is called the Total Stock Market Index at, at Vanguard. There are some people who recommend uh, this is the single uh, fund that a 20 or 30 year old uh, should own. Uh, because it owns basically all of the stocks in the U.S. market. Uh, there are some 3,500 of them. There are others, but they are very small compared to what's in here. And this is what we call a cap-weighted fund. It means that the fund is populated with the number, or the amount of money that represents the size of the company. So the biggest companies, they will hold a whole bunch of those, but for the smallest companies, they'll only own a little bit. So it, it reflects the impact those companies have on the economy, their size in the economy. And there's some good things about that, and there's some bad things about that as far as I'm concerned, but let me talk about the good things. The investors who are in this fund think they own uh, the, uh, in essence, the economy through this one fund. And in fact, it's at some level they do. And you'll notice over the last 10 years, been a good period for equities, particularly US equities, better for large than small, better for growth than value, but a good 10 years. Over 15 years, uh, 9.66 uh, instead of the 13.37 that the 10 years produced. But its worst year was virtually the same as the S&P 500 worst year, and that is a loss of 37%. In fact, there's almost no difference between the total market index and the S&P 500. This will look familiar, a loss, the worst year's loss was a loss of about 37%. Expense ratio, four one hundredths of 1%. The 10 year return instead of 13.37 is 13.55. By the way, notice that quite a bit higher than the average. And the 15 year return again is about 1% higher than the average. US stocks, instead of 3,500, 508. But these 508 companies are so big that they drive the return of the total market index to end up being almost exactly the same. In fact, the academics have taken their returns back to 1926, and the return is the same for both of these portfolios. 
So you can take your choice because the return is probably going to be about the same. If you were to watch anything on our website or read anything about how I think young people should invest, I wouldn't want them to be all in the S&P 500 or all in the total market index. I would want them to have a healthy position in value and even small cap value. The difference in return over time is huge. Uh, and yet the risk over time is not very different. Now I've got one more. This is the large cap index at, uh, uh, at Vanguard. Its 10 year return is 13.64, a little bit better than the S&P. How did they do that? Well, first of all, they have 557 companies instead of 508, but they're slightly more aggressive. And this is the part about investing that is, uh, uh, it takes all the magic out of what we can expect. We add fixed income, we're putting the brake on. We're likely over time to reduce the return. Go all equity, returns go up. Go more to small, the returns go up. Go more to value, the returns go up. In the long term, but on the short term, you can find lots of periods where bonds make more than stocks, where small companies may let, make less than large, where growth companies make more than value. But over this last 10 years, this fund, it's just another index fund, because it is slightly more aggressive in what it holds, it's only slightly, the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio is about 23 times earnings instead of 22. It's not much difference, but that little difference in this 10 year period was enough to add something to the return. And, um, I do some studies that look at 50 years of performance and you'd be amazed over 50 years, how much more money is made if you just could make an extra one tenth of 1%. So there are lots more funds that I like at, uh, at Vanguard, but these are ones that people are getting close to or in retirement. Uh, and, you know, I've never been down to the senior center, Reed, to see how old the people are there. Maybe I misjudged the word senior and uh, uh, should have uh, built these portfolios for younger people. I didn't know. Every, every year, senior gets younger, Paul. Just look at your own <laughs> life. <laughs> okay. I like that. Okay. Now, I want to make a little change here. And I want to look at... Oh, excuse me. I have one more fun. I do this... This, I like this, this fund, uh, but then there's some things about it that we, we should understand uh, as, we as we talk about counting on dividends. A lot of investors believe in buying dividend paying stocks and living off the dividend. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that one would expect to get a lower rate of return and probably pay more in taxes than they would if they simply bought a stock portfolio and when they wanted money, instead of expecting the company to distribute a dividend, you sell a few shares and you pay yourself a dividend. It's the same thing, except when you pay yourself the dividend, you probably are at a lower, well, and when I say pay yourself a dividend, if you sell shares, you may not even have a capital gains on those shares. And uh, if you do, the tax is going to be very small, probably. So why do I say that? If we compare the equity income funds, uh, oh, by the way, I should mention, look at the yield here, 3%. These are all companies, 182 companies that are paying big dividends. That's a, that's a good return in dividends these days. 
the expense ratio is 0.18. Worst year. Now, here's where the dividend income may help a little. That is that these tend to be considered defensive stocks. So when the market gets bearish, a lot of times people will look to these equity income kind of funds, dividend based, to move to thinking that they'll lose less. And in the worst year, instead of losing 37% in an all equity portfolio, you lost about 31. So that was some advantage. But I want you to notice, if we go back to the 10-year return of this particular fund, 13.6%, it's just a fund of big companies, stocks. Some of them do, in fact, uh, have a dividend built in. Because this 1.63 is all dividend. But 1364 versus 11.72 is starting to look like almost a 2% difference in return. And in that return are all the dividends. In the other return is all the dividends. So in essence, if you had paid yourself the dividends, not only would it have likely been more tax efficient, but you would have had another 2% a year to spend. If we look at the 15 years, I don't think it's quite that juicy. Well, 9.76 versus 8.67. It's, it's, it's still over 1%. So what the academics will tell you is there is no evidence that dividend stocks do better because they pay the dividends. In fact, the evidence is just the opposite. But it's just like when I talk to people about how the Wellington Fund has been around for since 1929, it creates a feeling of, of security somehow. And, and, and those dividends create a feeling of security. And in a sense, you can say in 2008, you were paid that premium because you only went down 31%. I'm not sure that's the way investors felt, actually. I suspect that 31% loss was just as hurtful as the 37. Distributions in retirement. We do a lot of work on distributions. In fact, it's a major part of our work. Our main focus, one, what equity asset classes should you have in your portfolio? Two, how many of each one of those equity asset classes should you have in your portfolio? Three, how much fixed income should you have in your portfolio at different stages of life? Uh, that's a lot of our serious work that where there's numbers, lots of numbers. And the last area are in distributions. We have just tons of studies done on taking money out of portfolios uh, in retirement, looking at 50 years, one year at a time. What did it look like? What did it cost you? What did you get? using 3% distributions, four, five, six, using fixed distributions or variable. But it does start, it does start with your phil philosophical view and your real view of your expenses and your risk. Because you go, when you're in, in retirement, you gotta really be thinking about expenses. You could be maybe lazy during the years that you were accumulating and may not be uh, so critical about overpaying expenses. But boy, when you're retired, let's get critical and let's look at how much risk you're taking and making sure you're not taking too much risk. Many of you, you have a goal of living well, but protecting your principal. Some of you want to live just as well, but use principal. This, this doesn't necessarily mean you, you die broke, but that you're willing to, to carve into the, uh, the, the money that you started your retirement. There are a lot of us who have this, this dream that we will retire with this pot of whatever it is for retirement. It will let us live the life that we'd like to live in retirement and be worth more when we die to help others. And we... we 
we find that the people who like to do that tend to be people who like numbers. There are a lot of people that, that I've dealt with in the past who they just spend what they want when they want to use it. They don't care about, they don't have a plan, they don't have budget, they just figure out that the universe will take care of them. And for a lot of people, the problem is something along the way bad happens. And one of the things about oversaving, which I'm a big advocate of either being a really smart investor or oversaving, if you can, and, and it's not as difficult as young people think it is, Warren Buffett says, and we should teach our young people, don't save what's left over after spending, spend what's left over after saving. We know today, they changed some years ago. They started when people came into a 401k, you were automatically enrolled. We didn't ask you whether you want to enroll, you had to opt out. You didn't have to opt in, you opted out. And theoretically you might say, well, I don't know, what difference would that make? It turned out that people learned to live. Way more people stayed in the, than ever got in using the the opt they had to opt out so they learned to live on what they had left over after their 401k was funded so my reasons for oversaving one is i can take out more and you'll see that i even advocate there are cases where you could take out six percent a year and yet most of the industry will say oh don't ever take out more than four percent well, there are conditions and ways under which, without being crazy, you can take out a lot more money. And I think that probably leaving more to children and charities, and our, 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 our kids always encourage us to spend the money, enjoy it. I never know whether that's the truth or not. But, you know, my sense is uh, that most of our kids would love it if we left them something. And I want protection from the unexpected. I'm one of those people, and at least I would guess somebody else here is, is, finds themselves to be this way. If somebody says there is a problem, my mind does not jump to the solution. My mind starts by jumping to the catastrophic. I always think about the worst that can happen. That makes it difficult to live with if you're an optimist, an optimist by nature. But that's just where I go. And so for me, having that extra money from oversaving helps protect me from the unexpected that I always expect, the catastrophic. I didn't know we were going to have a pandemic, but I, I, I could at some level see. I, see, I told you so. I knew that was going something like that was going to happen. Many of us are, it's, it's not a scarcity issue, I don't think, maybe it is, but it is that we want to prepare for the worst, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. If you have not oversaved, but you have enough, that plan becomes very important. Three to 4% distributions are probably going to be fine. And I think people who have just enough can learn to adjust to changes as they go along. Doesn't have to be a catastrophic situation. And typically 30 to 40% in equities is, is likely going to meet the needs for people who have enough. I don't mean you can't take more, but if you get too aggressive and you start taking out more than 4%, uh, you start running into some problems of, run, of, of odds of running out of money. But what do you do if you don't have enough? Well, you can get a job, you can reduce your cost of living, you can get better returns on your investments, or you can buy a pension. A lot of people don't realize you can buy the equivalent of a pension. And while I have never sold insurance in my life, I have never taken a penny of commissions. I have been an aggressive advocate for people who don't have enough. 
to consider for part of their portfolio buying a pension, the same thing as a pension. In fact, pensions are often from companies are, the, the company gives an insurance company the money to pay the pension. Well, you can give the money to the insurance company and have them pay you a pension, but you better doggone well know how to buy them. They're called single premium annu immediate annuities. They are a commodity. A company guarantees to give you a monthly payment for the rest of your life. Doesn't matter what the stock market's doing. It also doesn't matter how much more you need. You have a contract that they are going to pay you a check every month. That's what a pension is. And people live, learn to live with that when they retire. In fact, people love pensions. It gives them a sense of security. They don't have to worry about so much. And all these single premium immediate annuities are, is a pool of money that in essence, and they've been doing this for over 200 years. In essence, the people put the money in, you die. You get money out of it along the way, but when you die, you're broke. Now, you don't have to be broke. You can take less money and leave some money to others. You can take less money and have an inflation adjuster. You can take less money and add your spouse to the plan. But if you want to get the highest payout as a man or a woman, it's a single person for a single life. And when somebody does not have enough, and they're not going to get it out of bonds, you put money into a bond as an 84-year-old, you or what are you going to get? You're going to get two or three. If you want to go to a junk bond, you'll get three and a half. That same person could put money into a, a single premium immediate annuity and get paid over 10% annually, guaranteed for the rest of their life. If you're a female, you're going to get less. Why less? Let's take this 84-year-old person I recently helped. One of my clients asked if I would do this for old time's sake. And I did. 84-year-old female. If I run the numbers for a male, you get about 20% less. 20% less. And that's because, that's because, excuse me, I'm sorry, backwards, 10% more because males aren't expected to live as long as a female. They have to, they have to pay a female less because she's expected to live longer at the same age. Or if you pay for two lives instead of one, that's where the 20% less comes in. Because now the insurance company has to be prepared to pay for two people. And yes, you can leave something to your heirs if you want to. There's a fellow, Stan. His, his, his URL is Stan the Annuity Man. This guy is one of the, the most knowledgeable people in that single premium immediate annuity annuity industry. Uh, he even worked with Elizabeth Warren trying to get changes made in the insurance industry that are so detrimental to individual clients. One simple thing was to quit giving away, quit giving away trips to Puerto Rico in the winter for insurance salespeople who sell a certain amount be, would, would, would that motivate some people to sell harder one policy over another, even though the other policy would have been better for the investor? People have been known to do that. These four articles will tell you a lot about what you need to know. And he has books that he gives away free. He'll send them to you. He doesn't even just send you a 
and an email with a link. He sends you the books and nobody calls, nobody follows up. And this is what you get. If you go to his website, you don't even have to get the books if you understand the concept. And, and if you read his articles, I think you will. So for that lady, 84 years old, what could she get from highly rated insurance companies? And it turned out that Integrity Life Insurance Company, highly rated, would pay $2,992.53. Massachusetts Mutual Life, big company, about $100 less. Let's go right to the bottom. Nationwide, we see them on TV all the time. Nationwide, 2,371. Now this is not about nationwide trying to cheat people because there are times when nationwide will be on the top of the list. In fact, there are some insurance companies who won't even quote because they don't want any business for a certain aged woman or man because they've got enough in their pool. They have to manage these pools so they have the right balance of ages so it works for them and it works for these people as well. Now, the difference, how, if somebody from Integrity Life called on you and you trusted them and they, well, let's start with Nationwide. If they called on you and you like them and they seem to be upright people and they said, that's twenty three seventy one a month, and you think, wow, I can, I can get you know, twenty five thousand dollars a year or more for three hundred thousand. This is for a three hundred thousand dollar account. I don't know if I mentioned that. I'm sorry, but Stan, he he. This is what Stan says. If you're about to retire from a company that has a pension, before you take the pension, simply go put, he's got a calculator, he's got all this information online. You go in, you put your birth date. I put a phony name in. He doesn't, he doesn't care. Uh, I, and I put in a phony birthday. I'm not, I'm not 84. And you find out what you would get. And you can even say, what about uh, if, if it, I want it to be for uh, me and my spouse? It's going to be age-driven. It's not about your health. They would love it if you were not in good health. Because the sooner you die, the better off they are. I'm not saying they sit around and think about that. But that's the way it works. So here's what I recommended. On a $600,000 account, $300,000 in to the top dog on that list. And by the way, those quotes are only good for, I think, a week or 10 days because they change them all the time. I don't mean they change them after you sign the contract. They change them before you before the people sign up. 300,000 in the single premium immediate annuity, giving her almost $36,000. By the way, she, she, she needed about 30. This, is, this will give her more money to spend. And, uh, and 100,000 each in three different balanced funds, one that's 20% equity, one that's 40, and one that's 60. Her annual income from dividends, if she doesn't reinvest the dividends, she takes the dividends and the 36,000 will be about 41,000 or about a 6.9% rate of return. And she'll likely have some growth because she does have 
on average, 40% in equities. Now, I can tell you why a lot of people won't do this. Because you put that $300,000 in, and if you die the next day, you just lost $300,000. Now, you can get a lower payout. Uh, you could lose about a third. You could take a, th a third out of there, and they'll make a, a guarantee, I think, for the first 30 years or something uh, to, uh, uh, to pay it, continue paying it to your kids. But if what you want for your mom or your dad is some, some guaranteed income that will help them live a better life, and by the way, moms and dads, as they get older, they all become more susceptible to people who will use and abuse them if they can figure out how to do it. And the one nice thing about a, a contract like that, whether it's a pension or a, with a, a SPIA, it, it just comes in there. You, people can't walk away with it because you can't walk away with it. Our website, there's that best advice. This is where you go to get the best work that we do. And these are all links to things like podcasts and articles, free books. This is the new book coming out in a couple weeks. If I could get down on bended knee, here's what I'd ask. Please sign up for my newsletter. I don't care if you only sign up through the middle of December. It costs, it, it's, it's nothing, okay? You go to, in fact, there'll be a link you can go there. When you sign up, you will be contacted after the book is introduced at, 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 at uh, Amazon and they do, we do some sort of a celebration with people who paid probably 10 or $15 to get the book, either audio or, or, or uh, online or, or uh, hard copy, um, all the proceeds go when we do get it to the, to the foundation. Uh, I'm one of these typical Bainbridge foundations, small foundations, I work for nothing, which is uh, being overpaid. Um, you'll get this. And the reason it's gonna come to you, not as something only you can use, but as a PDF file, is I'm hoping you'll send it to your grandkids and your kids or the you know, people who are in their 20s. College classes will be giving this away. I'm, it's free to all the college kids and to teachers. Uh, it's about $12 million decisions, truly. Each of these 12, even with a modest $5,000 a year over 40 years, investing in a 401k, not even counting the match they might get. Each one, one alone should add uh, close to $10 million. One piece of advice, and I don't think there are many people in our industry that will disagree with it. Okay. So there's where you can sign up or Join me on Facebook. I love what I do. I love helping people. And uh, I hate the fact that I am but a teacher anymore. So I, I'm not here to solve individual problems, but I do take, I do take emails sent to paul at paulmerriman.com. And if I can, I'll give gentle pushes in the right direction. If somebody wants to meet with a hourly advisor that I think does pretty good work, never know what great is. Uh, I'm happy to, to pass along a name of a lady in uh, Seattle that does that. Questions? So there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one of them just touched on what you just said, Paul. What criteria would you suggest 
to find a financial advisor, especially for someone who lacks financial literacy. Is that, um, is that something you can answer? Oh, yes, the kind. One of my books is entitled free, it's a free book, Get Smart or Get Screwed. And uh, what it is, uh, oh, and then the subtitle is How to Select the Best and Get the Most from Your Financial Advisor. My druthers is that you find a way to be self-sufficient, but that doesn't and do it on your own because you save a lot of money. My clients always paid me something around, depending on the size, 1% or below. And, uh, and when I sold the company, we had about 1.6 billion under management. So, I mean, it was, it, we had a lot of really talented and they're still there. They're still, in fact, it, fortunately, I think they, they manage our money. I don't want to do it myself. But I do think for people who want to really squeeze all they can out, first, you do get an education. It's not very complex. People think investing is complex. It is not very complex. If you said to a hourly only advisor that you wanted to set up yourself a simple portfolio at, uh, uh, at Vanguard, uh, they would charge you probably anywhere from uh, $200 to $400 an hour. I would not want you to pay them to educate you. Educate yourself. You could read a book like Mutual Funds for Dummies or, or Personal Finance for Dummies. They're great books. But the investing is the easiest part of all for an advisor. And it is the part of the business that makes people the richest. It's really fascinating to me. And that is because I think so many people feel that the people who are in the industry know something they don't. I promise you that if you learn the basics of investing, that you know all you need to know. Oh, if you want to be in a mutual fund that's actively managed and you're going to pick an advisor who, man who, who runs that fund, a manager, to pick the hot stocks and to get in and get out and to take care of it for you and do it all, then you are hiring somebody who all the academics and, and virtually everyone in the industry agrees is a waste of money and that all you need is an index fund. Oh, well, how could it only take an index fund if index funds were all you need to do? Everybody would do it. Well, guess what? Most everybody is. It's only the people that haven't really had the, the that doesn't mean, by the way, it doesn't mean that people can't have fun picking individual stocks. But we watch the returns of the professional stock pickers and very few of them do better than the indexes. Doesn't mean you didn't do okay with the stocks you picked. And by the way, the group of people who I have great respect for are the people from Atlanta who got rich investing in Microsoft and the people in Seattle who got rich investing in Coca-Cola. Because what tends to happen is you do have a lot of people in this area that have gotten rich off investing in homegrown stuff. But it turns out in Atlanta, most of the rich people got there by owning Coca-Cola. Those people I'm happy for. But that doesn't mean that they are a great investor. And I'm, I, I'm not picking on them. I, I would include myself. I, I understand how to analyze the company, but I've been convinced from all of the academic research that index funds are better. Well, I just went through some index funds. You just need to know how much you should have in fixed income. And it isn't that complex. Now, the problem is 
You want to call somebody when things aren't going well and say, fix it. Or what should I do? And the whole industry has stay calm, stay the, stay, stay the course and everything will be okay. Well, Mr. Merriman, how do you know everything's going to be okay? Well, I don't actually, but I've been taught to say that, okay? Because nobody knows what the future is going to bring. But that's what you're talking about when you say, if you make a plan in advance and you know what the risks are going to be, that when it happens, you can say, I thought about this. I told you and so. I knew it. Yes, I thought about that. That's good. I, yeah, I, I, totally, I totally agree with that. And yet the industry has got to pretend that it's complex or they don't exist at the level of profitability they exist today. So I'm happy to help in, oh, I almost, I started to talk about a company called uh, a Garrett Planning Network, Garrett Planning Network. They have hourly advisors all over the country. I would love it if you could find an hourly advisor to figure out who the heck you are. And, uh, and, 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 and then have them tell you, okay, here's who I am. What should I do? They know how to tell you that. What in a couple of hours? But you got to trust them. See, that's the thing. It's so much of this process is about trust. Do I trust the mutual fund industry? Well, I trust them because they own thousands of companies. My, my wife and I own over 15,000 companies in our portfolios. So if I'm at a party, if I'm ever at a party again, and somebody mentions the name of a company, I can proudly say, yeah, got some of that. I mean, when you got 15,000 companies, you got most everybody. But do I believe those companies are trustworthy one at a time? Absolutely not. I don't know whether it's 10% crooks or 5% crooks. You know, you probably have your own number or maybe you think, no, no, they're all just good competitors who are doing the right thing. And no, no, how much they make is not what's on their mind. Taking care of the shareholders, that's it. So I just said, look, I've got 15,000 companies. I know there are some crooks in there taking money that they shouldn't be, but they are. Mr. Merritt? Yes. Hi, excuse me for interrupting. Can you tell me how the Garrett Planning Network advisors charge? Well, they charge by the hour. Now, now here's what their contract is with Garrett. They're all independent. They are required as a Garrett Planning Network member to work both, they can work both by the hour or a percentage of the money under management. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the reason that everybody wants money under management is because you get paid regardless of what's going on in the market. And, and I can tell you there would be, when you get into a big bear market, it can take years before people want to come back and do business with you if you're just investing on one transaction at a time. When you're managing their money, and by the, by the way, you can do a great service for people managing their money. I'm not saying that it's a waste of money. I'm saying that if you can learn how to do it yourself, you're going to put a lot more money in your pocket, probably 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to Vanguard, and you want to work with Vanguard, they have a service where they'll charge you 30 basis points or 31 hundredths of 1% to be your advisor. And I can even tell you what funds they'll put you in. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with them. And the fact is, what you could do is you can say, take me, I'm yours, I want your service, 
and I'm there are advisors there I know that they only take two million dollars and above and I don't know the ones that take 20 and above but they have different levels of advice which require different levels of expertise and you get lower as you get bigger and bigger the fees are lower and lower they're very conservative they're very conservative I never worry about them recommending something too aggressive but here's what you could do after you go through the analysis, they send you this nice plan and then which gives you more knowledge about yourself and kind of where you are in your financial life. And then you put the money to work after six months, a year, you can say, you know, this is great. I think I've got this. I, I think I can do this myself. And you fire them. And I can tell you something, they don't care. They got so much business. They, they have a hard time keeping up. So you don't have to pay the 30 mm -hmm. basis points, but there you are settled at Vanguard doing what you need to do. Now then you might say, mm -hmm. well, it depends how much money you have. For some people, they'll do a free, a, I'll call it a free look, a free piece of advice once a year, they've cut back on that a little bit, but I think they still do it for some accounts. Uh, and that you could then still have a free look, depends on um, how much money you have with them. Mm -hmm. They are such a low cost provider that you, you have to understand the limits. They are not going to give you tax advice on other parts of your, I don't think, I don't think they, some may. Um, there's one more question here, so, uh, I, Paul, that I think we, we might want to make sure we touch on. Uh, Barb is saying, I'm retired and I don't know how to pay myself. I think this is a big issue. Switching out of saving mode to distribution mode. Can you address that a little bit? Oh, I love that question. Well, I mean, the fact is you, you've got to sit down and negotiate with yourself. This is, this is no different than when you were working for somebody else. You're going to have to negotiate how much you take out, uh, and because you're you're now you're paying yourself, and uh, how much you pay yourself should be based on how much to start with, how much you need. So I'd want to know what are you getting from Social Security if you are, and what are you getting pensions, rentals. It's always good to know whether there's an inheritance someplace down there in, in, the, in your future that may have some impact on, on how much you should be willing to take out. Um, then you look at what you got. And if you can make it on 3% of that amount, that should be very a very safe withdrawal rate. You can go to paulmerriman.com. You can go to best advice. Hit, it has a drop down. Then you go to distributions. You open up distributions. There are articles, there are tables, there are podcasts about distributions. But here's the bottom line there's a table that shows the SP 500. And it shows it all by itself, 100% equity. It shows it 90% equity, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, all the way down to zero equity. And so you could look at what would life be like at a 3% withdrawal rate, I'm talking about financially, over the last 50 years, the next 50 won't look exactly the same, but there will be similarities, you will see that all of the columns make it to the bottom of the, of, of, the, of the page. They make it for 50 years. You can say, okay, I'm not gonna live 50 years. How does it look at the end of 30 years? And then you say, whoa, I might have that much money left over. I don't wanna have that much money left over. Let's look at 4%. Paul, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, there was a question earlier, and I, this will be the last one, I think, for the time we have, about looking at green or um, sort of like uh, uh, funds that are um, 
a sustainable. If you wish to do that, if you believe in being uh, socially responsible or ESG, whatever, you believe that that's the right way to go. From my viewpoint, you should then have all. I mean, how can you be half green? If you, if you believe in trying to do that, then what you want to do is to build a portfolio using a fund. Maybe what you would do is you would use a, and Vanguard has a socially responsible fund. You could invest in that fund, and then you could use a bond fund to go along with it if you're looking for some balance of fixed income and equity. And you could use that, that, that there's, a, there's a page, when you go to the uh, best advice, one of the things you can go to is called fine tuning your asset allocation. Go to the fine tuning table that is devoted to the S&P 500. And you will see by combining the S&P 500 with a certain amount of bonds, what the risk is over the long term and what the return has been over the long term. You won't just see the bottom line. You will see it one year at a time over the last 50 years. So you can go back and look at decades and kind of get a feeling. What would that decade have felt like living through and look at some good ones and some bad ones so you can kind of get a sense of, of, of what that wild ride might be like, but see it as a combination of stocks and bonds. I'm going to guess that the, the ESG or socially responsible fund you'll end up in will be very much risk-wise and return-wise like the S&P 500. Okay? Okay. You can use that table to judge the risk you're taking, how much you put in bonds, how much you would put into that particular fund. Now, if you wanted to find a, a regular bond fund at Vanguard, they have a total bond fund there. You could put your money, the fixed income part, you could put into the total bond fund. But it is not totally uh, socially responsibly based. And so my hesitation now is that I, I don't know a good uh, uh, fund that is uh, uh, based on a uh, bond fund that's based on ESG or socially responsible. I am going to do this though. Uh, I am going to take down a stack of books when I get home to Bainbridge, uh, written by a fellow, a, a dear friend, and uh, one of the smartest people I know. It, his name uh, is Larry Swedrow, and it's a super book on, uh, on for people doing retirement planning. Uh, I, I'm sure that you'll all find something in there that will be of value, and uh, I, hope, I hope, Reed, I can do that and then leave them there and they can pick them up from you. Does that work? Yep. Oh, should I attach that there should be some sort of a donation? Should I do that? No. <laughs> well, no. we no. always, no, what I say is we give freely and we invite you to give freely and it's worked out pretty well for people. All right. All right. Good program. I like that. So, uh, so yes, I mean, we welcome <laughs> donations. We're a nonprofit, but, uh, but we want to provide services uh, anyway. That's why we're here. And read you know that way. You know that way of thinking, Paul. Pardon? You know how to think that way. I you do. I do. Yes, you're absolutely right. 